Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Diamond, the 2010 Nobel Laureate in Economic Sciences. First of all, may I have the honor to invite Professor Joseph Sung, Vice Chancellor and President of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, to deliver a welcoming address and introduce our speaker. Professor Sung, please. Ladies and gentlemen, the Hong Kong government has recently projected that by 2041, 32% of the Hong Kong population will be above the age of 65. While we are having an aging society and the possible consequences are very well known, how to properly deal with the upcoming challenges remain very controversial. The debate of implementing a universal pension scheme in Hong Kong has been recently a subject of much dispute. According to the government's poverty commission, about 30% of our population, that is 30% um, uh, of our one million elderly are living below the poverty line in Hong Kong. And it is thus of significant importance to have a good public system that would address the consumption needs of our senior citizens and improve their well-being. On the other hand, there are also voices in the society pointing out that uh, in Europe, where the pension scheme is launched, it is a difficult experience. Something like 20% of the government's recurrent expenditure goes to, very, goes to the elderly population in various forms. If such expenditure continue to rise and the projection of a recurrent structural budget deficit beginning as early as 2029, some have argued that perhaps our priority should be set to eradicate OH poverty instead of having a universal coverage. There are a lot of concern about the long-term sustainability of a universal pension scheme in light of our low birth rate and the shortage of labor across job spectrum. I don't know whether in the audience you are for or against the universal public pension system in Hong Kong, but you will definitely agree with me that today we have the most suitable person to address this issue. Professor Peter Diamond is currently the Institute's Professor Emeritus of the MIT. This is, in fact, the highest honor for a faculty at the MIT. Professor Diamond received his bachelor degree in mathematics from Yale and his PhD from MIT in 1963 with his doctoral thesis supervised by Professor Robert Solo, the Nobel Laureate in 1987. In 1963, Professor Diamond joined the faculty of, um, joined the faculty in University of California, Berkeley, which uh, also um, is where he met his wife. And yeah, we got all the details about you. <laughs> Professor Diamond uh, held the John and Jenny Madonna Professor of Economic Chair and was also the first to hold the Paul Samuelson Professors in Economics. Professor Diamond is a very popular teacher. In fact, he said if he doesn't teach, he will have difficulty to find research topics. And I think this is uh, this kind of experience shared by many of us. And Professor Diamond has obviously served uh, many important positions, including uh, the presidents of many prestigious academic society, most notably the American Economic Association, the Econometric Society, and the National Academy of Social Insurance. Besides being a very well-known expert on retirement protection, Professor Diamond has also made fundamental contributions to a variety of areas, including the government debt and capital accumulation, capital markets, and risk sharing, optimal taxation, search and matching in labor market, and social insurance. Well, and uh, his CV is very, very long, so I'm not intending to uh, give you more information. Without further ado, may I present to you the Nobel Laureate 2010, Professor Peter Diamond. Thank you for that uh, almost embarrassing introduction, but my wife will be happy to know 
uh, that she was mentioned here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, she uh, joined me one time when we came to visit Jim Murley's here uh, at Chinese University, and uh, she certainly remembers uh, this place fondly. Uh, and th this, as you can infer, is not my first visit, and I'm glad to be here again. My plan for the talk is to begin with a little background about pensions uh, and how I think about them, or sometimes I'll say we, because I'm working together with Nick Barr, with whom I've written two previous pension books, uh, on another one, and the tentative title of the book is precisely the title of this lecture, so I'm drawing on, on ongoing work for that. The shape of my presentation is by looking at countries that generally have a good reputation for their pension system, looking at the details. The details are always a mixed bag. Looking at what work, works well, what works not so well, and I picked out issues that were particularly relevant for Hong Kong. Rather than pretending to be knowledgeable about Hong Kong, uh, I will point out things done in other countries, which is in indication that they can be done uh, and have relevance here. And I'll talk about the need for suitable discussion here as part of that. Okay. So obvious point, uh, pensions are focused on for the elderly. I'm not going to look at disability pension issues, which is also important. And there are various aspects of what we do for the entire population of the elderly. Consumption smoothing is helping people get a good mix between consumption when young and consumption when old. So consumption smoothing is a, a natural name for that because historically the, when before there were big pension systems and when many people didn't save, consumption would plummet when you were no longer working. And insurance is an element. There are multiple dimensions of insurance that pensions can help address that other vehicles don't do so well with. And third, of course, is poverty relief or more generally a concern with the income distribution of the elderly. In order to think about policies in this area, it's inevitable that you're addressing issues of risk sharing and addressing issues of redistribution, both within and across generations. A major complication in pension design is the diversity in labor market experience within any country. So it's one thing to say, I have an image of a worker he gets a good job, his wage grows uh, every year, works for 40 years, and then retires. What kind of pension system makes sense? That's a perfectly reasonable question and one you'd like to have an answer to before moving on. But it's of only limited help for addressing a pension system for a country because there will be other people who only worked for 20 years for a variety of different reasons. And going along, of course, the pension system will be subject to various risks which fall on people unless they get moved around to elsewhere. It's important when thinking about pension system is to think about the system as a whole. The system is made up of multiple pension plans. And when thinking about a plan, its role in the system is an important part of evaluating how well it does. And when you think about both saving for retirement and decumulating after retirement, it's important to recognize this is a complex area. Consumer information is limited. Consumer decision making, given whatever information they do have, is a very mixed bag. We have a lot of evidence from behavioral finance about how badly such a large fraction of the populace does. And if you're going to do this well, you need an understanding, for example, of the risk return frontier. 
Uh, if you don't have an MBA, you may not have a clear picture of what that means. So the system has to be designed for the public as the public really exists. The basic economics of pensions is very simple. Obviously, the pension is in an economy, so the output of that economy, which is the source of the consumption of the workers, and that, by that I include the returns on investments abroad, that matters. Incentives matter because people adapt to the incentives in a pension system just as they adapt to the incentives from the tax system, the incentives from regulation, the incentives from your employer, the incentives from your wife. I mean, all sorts of things matter for your economic behavior. The quality of government matters because it's a mistake to think you can set up a pension system once and for all. You will be revisiting it. And the extent to which you have confidence that the revisiting will do well gives you more range to do things in the near term. And costs of administration of a pension system matter a great deal. And one of the things I will pay attention to, an issue that I know is a serious issue here in Hong Kong, is how much of an impact on the size pensions you can afford come adversely from higher costs of administering the system. Risk sharing is inevitable. And here's a list of risks. And when you think about dealing with the risks, in part, automatic responses are handy. They happen quickly. They have some predictability. And you want predictability in a pension system so people can do the savings they're doing outside the system with an understanding of what will be coming inside the system. And on the other hand, you also want legislative adjustments because things will happen that the planners did not plan on. So you need both. Now, brief word. Uh, I was trying to guess what the audience would be like. I've talked in retirement communities in the US on Social Security. And everybody there is interested in the subject. And everybody there knows about it because they're getting a monthly check. Uh, I've spoken about pensions to younger audiences uh, who barely know what institutions exist. Uh, so I decided to put just a few background words in on the Hong Kong system. And so the first parts you probably know exist. Uh, and you may even have grandparents who are getting checks from part of it. Uh, my focus is going to be on the mandatory provident fund and also uh, the debate in the government's consultation paper that came out. And just a perspective before I start talking about other countries, the mandatory provident fund has 35 master trust schemes and 431 approved constituent funds. So keep those numbers in mind when I talk about some other countries. I want to start by talking about Chile. In 1981, under a brutal military dictatorship with serious attachments to conservative economists, Chile set up its defined contribution system, which is normally referred to by the acronym AFP for administers of finances for pensions. It's in Spanish, of course. Uh, and I did have three years of high school Spanish, but that was a while ago. And these things didn't exist when I was in high school. And the success Chile had, and I do view it very much as a success, inspired, first of all, the World Bank to encourage doing this elsewhere. Pretty much all of Latin America to adopt a Chilean style. Um, not a single one of them did it as well as Chile did, because it's hard to do well. And I say one of the problems is Chile made it look easy, but it is, in fact, hard. Uh, a swath of the former communist countries took it on as well. Uh, China, mainland China, did it. Uh, I wrote a report there for the government saying don't, but 
didn't work. Um, so the Chilean experience is where we start for two reasons. It's, it's historic. And secondly, it is a good example because they have good government and they modified it practically annually. They'd see how it worked and they'd make some changes. They'd see how it worked and they made some more changes. And so that was set up in 1981 as part of the system at the time there was a guaranteed minimum pension for anyone who was at least 20 years in the system. And they had a, a very low welfare payment for the really destitute elderly. So that was the whole system. And that went on from then until 2008 when under President uh, ba Michel Bachelet uh, they set up a solidarity pillar so this included a pension for people who have no pension and a pension top up for some of the population that had a pension through the system. So that's the background. And I want to tell you about the AFP system uh, and tell you some issues in thinking about it. All of the different countries that have defined contribution systems have a wide variety of rules as to how the firms managing the pension system can charge the workers for the process of accumulating their assets. Some charge up front, along with the contribution that goes into your pension, is a payment that goes to the fund. That's the way it is now in Chile. Some charge a percentage of the assets you have in the system, and that, of course, is the way it's done in Hong Kong. Uh, some charge with a mix of the two. It's quite diverse, and so it's a bit hard to compare the costs in different systems because they're coming from different bases. So here's a, a table based on a comparison when you have a 40-year career. If we're talking a 20-year career, the numbers are different. So if you pay a front-load fee, if you pay something when your money is handed in and after that, it accumulates without any fees. Obviously, the amount charged up front relative to what goes in is the amount that isn't there at the end if that was charged. So those two numbers match. If you pay an annual management fee that's a percentage of your account balance, then what matters is the fact that you're paying it year after year after year while your pension grows. With a 40-year career, your typical dollar is there roughly for 20 years. I say roughly because it's accumulating, there's interest rates, et cetera. So in order to find out the drop in how much you would have because of the fees compared to the same system without the fees, you multiply practically by 20. So a 1% per year fee knocks roughly 20% off what you would have at retirement after 40 years of, uh, of accumulation. Keep that in mind when I show you the Hong Kong numbers. So here's um, these ratios, the, the amount of drop because of fees from a wide variety of different countries done, as I say, by somebody's calculation converting them into this and the, the message to take away, two messages, you don't want to take any of this literally. The numbers are big. This matters. If you could say I can give you a 20% pension boost, that's significant. And secondly, the numbers are all over the place. Design of details matters because you end up with very different numbers in different countries. And just to put it uh, in the context of a charge on accounts, this is the equivalent charge on accounts. It's a tricky number to compare because it depends on whether you have a new system, the accounts haven't grown much, or an old system. Uh, but again, significant numbers, and they're all over the place. And Chile does pretty well. So, some words on Hong Kong. Um, I'm, gu I'm guessing there are a whole lot of people in this audience that don't have accounts because uh, you haven't gone to work yet. 
uh, but you will, and the government organizes information, and it's critically important that the government organize information, not just in the pension system, but the financial markets generally. Given the incentives, some firms have an incentive not to let you know what their charges are, and so it is a common practice, including in Hong Kong, to require them to provide information and re require them to provide information in a form that you can compare across alternatives. And of course, that's what's done here uh, with the fund expense ratio, the FER. And it's the total expenses as a percentage of the fund size, of your account size, and it's made up of direct expenses they have in running the system, plus the cost of actually managing the funds, plus other costs. So that's the definition. And here, not quite up to date, um, is the history of the average fund expense in Hong Kong. Uh, first message, it's come steadily down. If I added a couple of more years, because that date is available, just not from the source I took it from, it's continued to come down. It's come down a lot. It's still, as you can see, quite high, this average fee. So what are the fees made of? What's the breakdown between the different parts? Part of it is administration cost. Part of it is investment managing fees. And part of it is other administration aspects. And it's important to recognize that a lot of administration costs are primarily costs per account, not per dollar in the account. So if you have to communicate from time to time, if you take questions and you answer them, it, these are costs per account. If you're advertising, that's in the third category. That's relative to your sense of what you're trying to do. So this matters in terms of thinking about the structure because some of the reforms are reforms that will affect administrative costs. Some of the reforms are reforms that will affect the appropriate charges in dealing with the financial markets, and those will be different. The other element that's brought out, and, and let me just say, finding about the Hong Kong system, I found lots of insightful material coming from the government, uh, quite open about this. And so this uh, is a paraphrase, it's not a literal quote, but close to it, making another point with the Hong Kong system, which the charges are very different from different pension schemes, even for funds that are almost the same. How does that come about? Well, if you have this idealized view of a rational economic market, everyone would go to the lowest price. Uh, that isn't how financial markets work anywhere. And instead, people end up with something, they don't pay attention, they haven't checked alternatives, they don't know that funds are an important thing to check, and so you get a system that works much better for some people than for other people or maybe I should phrase that as much worse for some people than it does for other people. So let me tell you first about the Chilean system and then tell you about the Swedish system. Um, when Chile set it up, they wanted a system that would not have conflicts of interest with anything else. They were worried about conflicts of interest with the government, and they were worried about conflicts of interest with financial institutions. To deal with the conflicts with the government, while the government regulates this, the government never touches a peso. Workers pay directly to the AFPs that handle the funds, the money does not flow through the hands of the government and get delayed or get taken or what have you. I mean, still possible to take it away from the AFPs, but as, for example, happened in Argentina. Uh, but 
the sense here is the government is, is out of this business. And in Chile, where there's considerable respect for private property, the view was, since this is private property, it would be protected from government actions by the same kinds of protections you have for other private property. And indeed, that has been the case to date, although right now there have been some proposals to uh, do otherwise, but they're not going anywhere. And again, this, the importance of this depends on the quality of respect for private property elsewhere. So it wasn't worth anything in Argentina. It wasn't worth anything in Hungary. Uh, it didn't stop the Polish government from doing things. But it certainly has worked well in Chile. Um, so there's a small number of firms, and they're very tightly regulated. And one of the rules, if you want to set one of these up, <clears throat> is you can have nothing to do with any financial intermediary. So you can't have a local bank or a local investment firm set up one of these because it would have an incentive to get people to invest in their funds, which might not be good. This, I suspect, is a problem in Hong Kong. I don't know. Uh, this is certainly a problem um, in some countries and it's a problem in the private market in the U.S. U.S. is now having a debate on creating fiduciary responsibility for financial advisors to try to cut down the extent to which they give. Right now they're required to give advice on a suitable fund. That gives them, can't do something too risky, but a less good suitable fund is still there. Uh, so that's the Chilean system. To begin with, each firm had one fund. And there were, I don't know, to begin with, a dozen firms. So that's the range of choice. Now each firm is allowed five funds, but mostly they're just a mix of stocks and bonds with the proportions changing. And now we're down to six firms. So your choice is over six alternatives. And within each alternative, over five, four, the amount of risk, so you've you got basically 30 alternatives total, um, much below the number for Hong Kong I showed you. When Sweden in the mid-90s moved away from a pension system that had bad incentives and had an unsustainable trajectory, they divided their 18.5% pension fund, pension, uh, pension tax, 16% for a mostly pay-as-you-go ongoing system, and 2.5% for individual accounts like the MPF. And they were, politically what they did was the left designed the pay-as-you-go part and the right designed the other part, and they got to design it on their principles. And the right was a great believer in choice. So any Swedish mutual fund with a reasonable amount of diversification and functioning in the Swedish market could open up something within the system. And as a result, there are now 851 different funds. The charges are less than the charges outside the system because unlike Chile, Sweden trusted the government the government collects the contributions. The government keeps the information person by person over what funds they have and how much they have in each fund. And each month the government transfers money on a net basis to the funds. The funds don't know who their customers are. The funds only job is to take the money invested and invest it well. And they're dealing with large sums transferring. The government has obvious enormous economies of scale in this and economies of scope because they combine it with tax collection. So it's low cost. The government keeping administrative records means overwhelmingly each person has one account. Uh, the costs of that are low. The government to begin with needed to set up a default 
because some people wouldn't choose. You were allowed up to five funds out of the number. And so if you didn't return a form, uh, they needed a default. They decided that the government would have an agency that would set up the default you went into. Unlike the discussion here, where each scheme has to set up a default. Secondly, the default was really well run. I knew Swedish economists when the system started who tore up the form because they knew if they didn't mail it in, they couldn't get into the default. And after pressure over how good it was, the government now lets people choose to go into the government-run fund. And so the government is now competing with the private market. Um, so let's look at the premium pension in general. There are the costs, way low. Uh, there are the fees on the individual accounts, way low. And um, the costs are in part limited and part less than in the market. And here's the government fund. It has a global equity fund. It has a global bond fund. And there are the fees, vastly less than anything you can find in Hong Kong. And when you go there, you can design your own, or you can pick one of these three of, of different mixes. And this remains the default fund. And here are the default rules similar to the rules that have been proposed here for the defaults, you're completely in equities till 55, you're still a third in equities after 75, and you have a smooth transition. Interesting perspective on what's risky, and indeed, if you've got all nominal bonds, you've got a lot of inflation risk, and so having some equities makes it safer, not more risky, and that's important. So what happens in Sweden, to begin with, even though the government urged everyone to go in, a third of the public ended up in the default. By the next year, we're starting to get into mostly young workers getting in the system for the first time. The fraction in the default jumped. Nowadays, everyone new in the system is in the default. They don't have to stay there. Uh, but my guess is, I haven't seen any data, most of them do. Designing a good default is important, and when your default is doing this much, how you design the rest matters because it's only for people who are making choices, and you've got to give them good choices. Another example I want to tell you is not a national system. It's a system for the federal government employees in the US. So it's a small system. It only covers three and a half million people. I guess by the standards of some countries that could be a national system. And there are five funds there. Government bonds which are handled by the government and four others which are index funds. And what they do from time to time is have an auction for companies that run these funds in the private market and are large enough, they've attracted enough business. And the auction is how low a fee you charge to get the fund. And then within TSP, and again, as with Sweden, they just handle the net amounts of money. And within the system, they have life cycle shifts among the five. What are the expenses? Essentially nothing. It's a little unfair. There's only one employer, the federal government. It does everything electronically, and it answers a lot of the workers' questions back in the agency, not handled by these costs. So the administrative expenses are, are lower than would be reasonable without that restriction. Uh, but the other expenses, the expenses of actually handling the money, essentially nothing. So here's a finding from um, a Hong Kong report that since the employer chooses the fund, not the worker, uh, there's less price competition 
suggesting the advantage of worker choice, and an element of worker choice was brought in. On the other hand, here's the government recognizing uh, that this is hot air without content. Uh, you cannot simply rely on market forces to keep fees down, not even in Chile, where there are clearly excess profits being made. The fees are pretty low, but not down at marginal cost pricing levels. Um, and so here are some proposals that are out there, sensible list of things, but staying within this system, which is an inherently expensive system. And here again uh, is an important element. Uh, this again comes from a government document that costs are connected with a number of accounts. So if you have multiple accounts per worker, because they're not gathered together, it builds up costs. And four million accounts, three accounts per member. Here again from a government document, cost per account and cost per member reflecting the fact that there are multiple accounts. Hong Kong, Australia, which I studied years ago, huge problem. Uh, if you don't have that, I don't know anything about the Mexican system. Um, and the, the U.S., I don't know what they're even referring to since we don't have a national system like that. But that's an issue that one might think about addressing. Here's the default here. Uh, other than the fact that it's a separate default in every separate scheme, uh, this struck me as a very sensible design. So that's all I have to say on the accumulation process. Next, I want to turn to what happens when you start drawing down, when you're using the money to finance retirement. So there's a mix of annuities and lump sum withdrawals. Annuity is a payment that lasts as long as you live and stops at that point, although you could set it up at what's called a joint life annuity, so it could continue as long as one of you was alive, or it could be cut in half at that point. There's a variety of rules, and you can have them as a flat amount, which is what they have, for example, in Singapore. You can have them in real terms rather than nominal terms, so it would go up with inflation. They have those some places in the U.S. That's the way some national defined benefit systems work. They could be indexed to um, something. They could be variable, meaning it depends on the rate of return. It could vary with the mortality experience. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. And of course, when people are choosing, they have an idea of their own life expectancy. And so they have an idea of the value of the insurance inherent in an annuity for them. And there's a serious adverse selection problem. This market by itself is not a great success anywhere in the world. Um, lump sum withdrawals, you can have limits on it uh, to, so people don't run out of the money. In Chile, the limits uh, in part are focused on protecting the government budget of the guaranteed minimums, minimum income level. So they stop you from running down below that by taking it out too quickly. What's interesting in Chile is not that they have annuities and they're indexed annuities. It's the process they have. Because since an annuity market works badly, they want to make insurance firms bid for individual workers, which is an interesting way of doing it. They have a website used by the insurance companies used by the individuals, and there's bidding. And so you have to go through this. You're thinking of where to put your money if you want a programmed withdrawal. You get told how much you can take out going different places. And they have a significant amount of annuitization going on there, but some of that is related to a different incentive. You buy a big enough annuity and you can take the rest out as a lump sum. So again, interesting incentive to get people to protect themselves in an insurance product that is hard to have a market function well. In Sweden, 
that 2.5% accumulated when you, in Sweden, where they set up the accumulation with this vast array of private options, they concluded that the insurance industry was not up to the job of providing the annuities. And so the government provides the annuities. And you have a choice between an annuity that fluctuates with the interest rate on the portfolio you've got, which you can choose, and the actual mortality realization. The government bears no risk. Or you can choose a traditional Swedish annuity, which is called a with profit annuity, you're guaranteed a very low amount, and when the insurance company is doing well, it pays you more. Uh, here, if that should go bankrupt, the government does bear the last risk. This reflects the fact, one, annuitization is difficult to make function well, uh, and secondly, that's true everywhere, and indeed, in Singapore, the annuitization piece is run by the government, but it's in nominal terms, no inflation adjustments automatically. But then on the other hand, they change it from time to time when they feel like it. Uh, that's what happens when the public has faith in the government, and at least in this area, the faith seems to be reasonably well placed. So now I want to go back to Chile and get to the other hot topic in Hong Kong. Chile set up the solidarity pillar, as I said, in 2008 uh, because of their dissatisfaction with how their accumulations worked. And I want to tell you a little bit about the dissatisfaction and then a little bit about the pillar and about others like that. What they have done for this commission that was recently appointed is look at the history of all of the people with accounts. And they asked the question, what fraction of months do workers actually make deposits? And the density of deposits for the population as a whole was under a half. So thinking of the wonderful pension you'd get by 40 years of contributions every month is one thing. But the dissatisfaction with the low level of pensions in Chile was in part related to the fact that there's a lot of informality and people not paying. And this is an issue throughout Latin America. This is, that was a report on the whole history. Uh, this is a snapshot of one month, what fraction of people with accounts donated that month. It's all over the place uh, and it's not very high anywhere. I don't know anything about how this would be in Hong Kong, but people move in and out of the labor force uh, all the time. People are in covered jobs, uncovered jobs. This is a micro simulation for the US uh, to make the point that this is not just a developing country problem, but is also a problem in advance countries. The article I drew this from looked at historic data, but that's older cohorts. And then they took current parameters and did a micro simulation. The US pension system looks at your 35 best years, and they index up your earlier earnings. And so they, if you have fewer than 35 years with contributions, forget about measuring in months, but years, then they put zeros in the averaging formula. And so this asks how many people have how many zeros? And what you can see adding up uh, the bottom set, uh, at least 11 years of zeros is 30% of the current US population according to the simulation. So again, diversity in the population is a central part of design of the system, and why there is a role for a non-contributory pension along with a contributory pension. Um, so here's the system in Chile. Uh, it spends just under 1% of GDP 
for this. Obviously, it will be going up over time if they don't change anything else. It comes from general funds. And by and large, the beneficiaries are lower income people. Who gets it depends on how much you've got in the other account. It's targeted to cover 60% of the population. And they chose that number because that's the number they could finance with the money they were willing to set aside for it. The target is to get that up to 80%. They don't want to give it to everybody. They don't want to give it only to people below the poverty line. They viewed this as important for having a good pension system across the board. Second country I'll talk about that is very interesting, but I won't get into the other part, is the Netherlands, which has a pension. I don't know what in Dutch AOW is an acronym for. It's a pension that goes to everybody over 65. If you were resident, not working, but resident in the Netherlands for 50 years from 15 to 65, you get 100% of the pension and the pension is above the poverty line. It's subject to the income tax, and that's it. Everybody gets it. If you're there half of those 50 years, you get half the pension. Um, and there's a dedicated revenue for it, a piece of not the regular income tax, but it taxes incomes that's dedicated for this. So public spending on non-contributory pensions, again, this is Latin America, there's significant spending for it in lots of countries. So let's take a look at the debate here. Um, the actual material has not been available for long, uh, but the leaflet, the two-page leaflet about uh, the uh, report uh, is available. And it draws, as I'm sure you all know, a picture of two systems. One which is focused on poverty and one that is meant to be universal. That's what it uh, describes. And it, the leaflet starts with the philosophical stance that the government is trying to contrast between retirement protection being a basic right, not a welfare benefit, and so there should be no means test. I find this a very odd statement. So the Netherlands, where you're subject to the income tax and people with higher incomes are in higher brackets, is that a violation of this principle? Canada, where they have a non-contributory pension, and they rake it back, they call it an affluence test, the top 5% get nothing. The other 95% get something. Chile, as I said, 60% get something. Other countries have chosen different target populations. And it seems to me you can't think of this as a universal basic right when so many of the countries whose governments we respect have a different perspective. On the other hand, the other version is the resources should be targeted towards the needy, says we're not going to recognize the ability of the government to help people cope with difficult decisions. If you're not really needy, it's your problem, not ours. That, it seems to me, is not a proper stance for a government concerned about its population. So I view this report as hopelessly inadequate. It's inadequate because there's a continuum of options between these two. And instead of presenting two extreme views and nothing in between, the country and the government should be reviewing a continual range of options. And so there is the target audience in the two cases. Both strike me as the wrong targets, but then again, I'm not knowledgeable about the income distribution in Hong Kong and the availability of resources. But there are lots of ways to adapt your system 
to the resources you can make available as the population ages. You can have a different size monthly pension. You can change the age at which it starts as people are living longer. Maybe you don't start at 65 anymore. You start at 66 or 67, and you can index that automatically. Do you make it universal, as in one example, or test it? Test it, that means some people won't get it. And you can set aside funds for it ahead of time so that the costs don't rise directly with the cash flows. And for example, um, there are countries, Chile has a, a pension fund, a sovereign wealth fund investing globally that is earmarked for the pension system. Norway has it, but that doesn't count. It's just oil money they set aside. Uh, Canada has a fund that adjusts in their DB system with projections that will either do a combination of raising benefits uh, and lowering contributions depending on how it goes. So there are ways to spread this out. None of this is discussed, at least in the leaflet, and I suspect it's not in the report. What kind of testing is there? Well, that's what's so interesting. As I mentioned, Netherlands, just an income tax. Canada looks at your income and rakes it back from some. Uh, the US has an income and wealth for the only thing we have for all of the elderly, um, which goes to a very small slice of the population. Sweden has the non-contributory pension, which it tests against how much pension you have from the mandatory system. And for any of these, you could aim at a low level, only the worst off, like the US, at a high level, like Canada, or something in between, like Chile. Um, this statement by Nick Stern is in the foreword to my book with Nick Barr. And it seems to me it captures um, an important view of what this is about. Uh, this appears in both of these books, since it's just a translation. Uh, if you prefer Spanish or Polish, it's also available there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Diamond, for sharing your words of wisdom. Please remain on stage. Professor Diamond has kindly agreed to take a few questions from the audience. Now, may I invite Professor Junsen Jan, Weilong Professor of Economics and Chairman of the Economics Department at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, to come onto the stage and conduct a question and answer session. Thank you.